November 29, 2009. A quiet town in Cheshire is rocked by the discovery of a woman's body. A suspect is on the run, and the clues to the murder are on a social networking site. Social networks have become a 21st century global phenomenon, but in the wrong hands, there's a dark side. The internet is an amazing tool for getting information about people, but it can also be used in a negative way. In the space of a year, five British women were brutally murdered. All of them linked to the sinister misuse of a social network. If Lucy hadn't met H on the internet chat room, life could have been different. I don't understand why he did what he did and to that extreme. For millions, the online world has become part of everyday life. But how has it led to real-world murder? To murder his wife and the planning afterwards to dispose of the body shows the limits that he would go to. October 26, 2009. Middlesbrough Police Station. Peter Chapman is about to confess to a murder. Right, do you remember what you sent me in the cell? Uh, okay. Yeah, from the last night on the cell, from the UCI, where the body's... His victim was 17-year-old Ashley Hall, a local girl reported missing from home. She was on her way to meet a teenage boy she'd been talking to on the social networking site Facebook. But Ashley didn't know that the Facebook page concealed a deadly secret. The boy didn't exist. The profile page had been set up by 33-year-old convicted sex offender Chapman, a man with a history of rape and sexual assault. Within hours of meeting, Ashley had been raped, murdered, and her body dumped in a roadside ditch. Dr. Mike Berry is a clinical forensic psychologist. He studies killers, the way they commit their crimes, and what prompted them to murder. Peter Chapman is an unusual and a high profile case because what he's done as a sex offender is he's actually used modern technology, Facebook, social networking, to capture potential victims. And in this case, we've got a 17 year old girl who's clearly taken the bait and he has slowly groomed her into the relationship he wants with her. The police discovered that Chapman had 10 social networking accounts and 6,000 young female friends. None of them knew his real identity. Social networking's darker side had been exposed. The worrying thing about this case is it's not unique. We know that there is increasing contact that's going to lead to serious assault, rapes, and tragically, in some cases, murder from connections via social networks. And just one month later, another Facebook page conceals secrets which would eventually lead to murder. Cheshire, on the banks of the River Mersey. It was here that Vicky Wynne Jones grew up. A bright, ambitious girl, she excelled at maths and enjoyed a close relationship with her family. She was funny loud, um, just happy to be Vicky really. Really bubbly, really content, um, really comfortable in her own skin. She didn't care if people had an opinion of her, it was just Vicky. She was, she was happy. She was sort of like the, the loud one of the family, which is what people say I take after. Um, but yeah, she had a very good sense of humour. In 2005, a 21-year-old Vicky met Michael Robert. It was just a friend from work because I don't think they'd actually started to go out together at that point. And then they just sort of chatted a lot on the phone and one thing led to another and then they started going out together. We were having um, a night out in the pub and it was the first time that like him and Vicky had been out officially um, as a couple. So we'd been having a few drinks and it was laughing and joking and being part of the party and he felt quite comfortable considering he'd only just met the family. And then we all went into town afterwards and he was, he was a giggle. He was... He was quite fun, really, and, and good for Vicky because he made her laugh. The relationship blossomed and they began spending more and more time together. They were very much joined at the hip. They were, if they were sitting on the couch, they'd have to sit on the same couch or 
to having a meal it'd be like the same food and they were very much holdy hands and they were always together. It just seemed to fit into the family brilliantly. And soon Mike took the step to formally join Vicky's family. Mike asked us early on in the relationship as to whether he could ask Vicky to marry him. Um, and from what we knew of him, he was, I just thought that he made Vicky really happy and he adored her and they just seemed a really happy couple. Even the choice of engagement ring became a family affair. Mike had seen the ring he, he'd like and he took us all to town to show us it and Vicky didn't know a thing about it and he said he was going to propose on her birthday so he took her out for a meal and Mike's parents came round here and we had champagne ready just hoping Vicky would say yes. And she did say yes. The couple married in June 2009 at the local church before jetting off to a honeymoon in Spain. When the wedding was over, she was saying it was like one of the best days of her life. It was, it was a, her furby tale, it was her wedding, so and she loved it, really loved it. By now, the couple had already moved into a flat in nearby Runcorn. Michael worked as a mobile phone salesman, and Vicky was an accounts manager for a chemicals firm. But despite their busy lives, they always found time for family. We used to see them maybe three or four times a week, and. Vicky would pop in if she was driving past. But in November 2009, just five months into her marriage, all of this stopped when Vicky Roberts disappeared. I got a phone call at work off my mum saying that Vicky had gone missing and that Vicky's work had phoned the house because um, they couldn't get in touch with her on her mobile to say that she hadn't turned up for work since she'd left on the Friday. Vicky was last seen on the Sunday, but no one had heard from her since. To find out what had happened, the family turned to Michael. I phoned Mike from work and sort of said what's going on and he said that he, she'd left him. Michael's response shocked the family. He said he'd received a text from Vicky declaring she'd met someone else and the marriage was over. But claims of Vicky having an affair just five months into their marriage didn't ring true. I couldn't imagine Vicky ever leaving Mike in a month of Sundays. She was smitten with him, and if she was going to leave him, she would have come home. She wouldn't have gone anywhere else. She would have just come home and said, "I've split up with him," or she wouldn't have. She she wouldn't have cheated on him ever. It had seemed the perfect marriage, but behind closed doors and hidden on Facebook lay clues to a secret life which had triggered a tragedy. In November 2009, Vicky Roberts disappeared from her home in Runcorn, Cheshire. Her husband of five months, Michael Roberts, had dropped a bombshell, claiming she'd walked out after finding a new man. When Mike had said she left him, I couldn't picture Vicky just walking out on him. Whatever had happened, Vicky's family just wanted to find out where she'd gone. There was a lot of concern as to where she is and what sort of state of mind she was in, whether she was upset about it or um, or whether she was scared to come to us or I don't know. We were, we were just a bit lost as to what to do. With no idea where Vicky was, all her family could do was keep calling her mobile phone. We just kept ringing constantly. I think Lisa must have rung her five times an hour for 12 hours. We just kept getting straight to voicemail. With anxiety growing, the family went in search of clues at the flat she shared with Michael. When we met him at the flat, he was very edgy, um, but we just put that down to him being upset at Vicky leaving him. He showed us the text messages on his phone that apparently Vicky had written to him, saying that she'd left him for someone else and that she loved him and that she'd gone. The search yielded few clues as to where Vicky might be. We've been through the flat and looked through stuff, tried to phone the banks to see if a cards had been used and we've been down to the garage to have a look in a car. Vicky's handbag was still in the car, but all her clothes and a suitcase had vanished. I couldn't process it all, to be honest with you. I, I, I just knew I was feeling really uncomfortable. And what was making the family more suspicious 
was Michael's behaviour. I thought he'd be distraught, but he didn't seem to be. Bits that Mike said didn't add up, and that started to unnerve me a bit. The family left notes in case Vicky returned. Just a few hours later, they received a text from Vicky's phone. But once again, it raised more questions than answers. I just knew it wasn't from Vicky because it wasn't in Vicky's sort of language or manner. It was very vague and it just wasn't Vicky's style. It was now four days since Vicky was last seen and concerned about her safety, the family reported her missing to the police. Their first step was to contact Mike. Hello, Mike Roberts speaking. Hi, Mike, it's the Cheshire Police. We're dealing now with, uh, with Victoria and, and the priority is just to make sure she's safe and well at the moment. I've not, I've not heard from her at all. I need you to go home and meet a police officer. Right, uh, possible with work. Uh, yeah, give me I'll be about half an hour. All right, that's great. When police arrived at the house, they began to unravel what had really happened to Vicky. Officers went to search the flat. Michael went downstairs with one officer in order to search the garage. And at the end of the garage, there was what appeared to be some bedding and some bits and pieces on top, which Michael himself referred to as rubbish. The officer asked him to open some of the wrapping and it's only when he did that that um, the officer saw what he thought was a part of a, a, a human head. Michael just turned on his heels and, and ran. In the case of Vicky Roberts, the police had yet to discover the importance of social networking. In another case, some four months later, Social networking was the essence of the case. Lucy Davis grew up here in the valley town of Pontypridd, South Wales. She was a popular bright girl with dreams of becoming a teacher. Her father, Roger, has fond memories of his eldest daughter growing up. Lucy was articulate. She was very clever. She was a brilliant musician. She was her own woman. In her early 20s, Lucy had a child with a partner she met at university. They had little money. They just about managed to pay the bills. There was a very sort of low-key um, life. But I, I say for all that, they, they were well-fed and happy. But by the late 1990s, Lucy began to feel trapped at home. So she turned to an early form of social networking, internet chat rooms, to escape. Her partner was working nights when she put the baby or the child to bed um, she would get on the computer and chat all over the world. She just did a bit of networking I suppose and I think at that time she considered them all as friends. But one online friend made a particular impression. She met somebody in America who in, in our view, groomed her, sent her money, impressed her with his lifestyle. I think she, her head turned. And perhaps spending so much time with him, her relationship with her partner sort of broke down. The American was Harold Landry, a millionaire Texan, 24 years older than Lucy, who had made his cash from oil. He was soon in the UK flashing his cash and making an instant impression on Roger. Over dinner, he introduced himself, said he'd come from the swamps of Louisiana. He was flash. He had perfect teeth, six foot loud. And he, he just was the epitome of any Texan you'd ever seen. He'd always make an impression. He was proud of being American. But I, I was never impressed with him. Despite Roger's reservations, the couple soon married. They had a child together and moved into this millionaire's private estate near Worcester. She went from a rather ordinary existence to being, if you like, lady of the manor. I think he saw her as somebody he could hang on his arm and say, well, 
look what I've got. But despite her plush new surroundings, Roger was suspicious that something was wrong. My wife and I were, were more sort of concerned with, why has he been divorced twice already? There must be more to it. There must be some sort of background, something we don't know. And there was background, of course. Twelve years earlier, he'd been charged with attempted murder. The victim had caught Landry having an affair with his wife. And when confronted, Harold had shot him in the face at point-blank range. The victim only survived after emergency surgery. Landry was found guilty of aggravated battery, but escaped jail. Harold shot somebody at point-blank range. The character of that is quite interesting. He's got to be very impulsive, he's got to be very confident he can get away with it, and also it shows total lack of anger control. Why respond so violently? Just to instantly pull out a gun and shoot somebody. Very impulsive, very dangerous. But unaware of Harold's violent past, Lucy began to challenge his authority. She was talking about joining a local choir with one of her friends and jo joining an orchestra. He didn't like that idea. He wanted her to be looking after him all the time. He didn't actually want her to have a life of her own. As well as being controlling, Landry also began to show a violent side. When you're drinking for 12 hours a day, at the end of the day you can actually be a bit nasty. And sometimes his true self showed. Our grandson told us that one day he found his mother at the bottom of the stairs and she said she'd fallen but she had bruises on her arms where obviously she'd been held so we think that he pushed her downstairs on top of the violence Lucy suspected that Harold might be having an affair the marriage was in free fall and the cyber world which 10 years earlier had introduced Lucy to Harold now offered her a way out Lucy, being upset, bored, needing something to do, uh, got on Facebook. With 500 million users, it wasn't long before Lucy found a sympathetic ear and the beginnings of a new relationship with a former school friend. They did correspond, they did sleep together, and this precipitated the violence that came about. Nobody knows when Harold learned of his wife's Facebook friendship, but on February the 1st, 2010, after a lengthy drinking session, he sought to end the relationship in the most final way possible. I think he wound himself up to a point where he couldn't control himself anymore. Fractured a skull with a great big granite rolling pin. A knife flew her face so it came out somewhere by her ear. Pursued her through the house and carried on hitting her with his fist. She escaped from the house, ran towards a neighbour screaming for help. He caught up with her and stabbed her another 20 times until she died. The level of violence in this case it was horrific, and it's classic overkill. We say this when somebody has a personal relationship with a victim, they often use much more violence than necessary, but this is indicative of this kind of volcano, of explosion of violence and aggression towards her, which had been building up and up, and then this explosion. Landry ran away from the scene, but the police soon caught up with him. In February 2011, he went on trial for Lucy's murder. When he came back from the witness box after telling a load of lies, um, he looked at us with a face of thunder. He looked as if he could kill us. I think he said we were all responsible for what happened. He can't see that he was in any way to blame. 
I mean, clearly he is responsible for Lucy's death. But he's going to justify that by saying, well, she provoked me. She needs to take responsibility for what she's done. And while you can see the logic in that argument, you have to go back to the basics and say, but you killed her. The trial lasted six days, but the jury took just four hours to reach a verdict. They found him guilty. We all cried with happiness, I think. Landry was sentenced to life with a minimum of 16 years in prison. Social networking played an integral part in Lucy's life. How big a part it played in her death, only Harold can know. It's something Roger will always wonder. If Lucy hadn't met H on the internet chat room, if she hadn't met this guy from Pontypridd on Facebook, life could have been different. As far as I'm concerned, I hate social networking in any form. Back in Runcorn, Cheshire police were launching a murder investigation and they were about to uncover the illicit affairs conducted on social networks that held the key to the crime. In Cheshire, the battered body of 25-year-old Vicky Roberts had just been discovered in the garage of the flat she shared with her husband, Michael. Police launched a murder inquiry and had the difficult task of informing her family. It was about half past midnight on the Friday morning and we heard a car at the top of the road and we thought maybe it was Vicky and it was a, a police car. You know, your life just changes in that split second. Nobody could say as to when it happened, but I knew that it must have been the Sunday night um, because that was the last time that Vicky had been heard from, really. News of Vicky's death was swiftly followed by the revelation that her husband, Michael, was the prime suspect. They just said that he'd run off and that the helicopter was up searching for him and that police were all out looking for him. Leading the police investigation into Vicky's death was Detective Inspector Joe Miller. Michael ran from the scene and um, ran into Scrubland, we believe now, up to part of Runcorn where he got a taxi and went into Liverpool. Michael's movements that night had been captured on CCTV. Here he's seen withdrawing cash just a couple of hours after going on the run. In Liverpool, he was filmed on a late night shopping trip. During that time, he bought clothes and uh, tried, in some respects, to disguise himself by wearing a cap. With his new image in place, Roberts checked into a hotel in nearby Chester, but he wasn't there for long. Michael was on the run for uh, about four days, uh, and he stayed in uh, various hotels throughout the northwest. Here, police tracked Roberts to another hotel in Nantwich. 24 hours later, he was on the move again, this time in North Wales. Roberts was desperately trying to evade capture, but he hadn't banked on a manhunt. Michael's face was all over the television. The story was reported on the radio, uh, it was on the internet, and really, he had no escape. On Saturday, December 6, 2009, the net finally closed. The police received a tip-off that he was in Wrexham. Once we knew that Michael was in Wrexham Town Centre, then we had the cooperation of uh, the Town Centre CCTV system, and the operators there were able to quite quickly locate Michael. You can see him reacting as he hears the police sirens obviously the police officers approaching to arrest him and his arrest is recorded on the CCTV. Seven days after Vicky went missing police finally had the chance to quiz the main suspect and how she'd ended up dead. 
he kind of just went along to the police and handed himself in. There is a sense of, well, it's over. And again, um, the, his guilt becomes even more obvious in a sense. So that in many ways, that once they have been caught, they know the game's over and they confess quite quickly. But back in Cheshire and under questioning, Michael didn't follow the routine killer's confession. When Michael was being interviewed, he was uh, sobbing, um, saying how much he, he loved Vicky and how it had all been a tragic accident. An autopsy revealed Vicky had been strangled, but Michael had an explanation for how it had happened. Michael always maintained that Vicky's death was, was caused during a, a sexual act that had gone wrong. Roberts claimed he had tied a dressing gown cord around her neck during sex, but police forensics quickly proved this was a lie. The mark on her neck was not consistent with what he said had caused it. So we knew what he was saying was not right, was not true. D.I. Miller had her man, but the investigation still needed a motive to prove Vicky's death was no accident. When we're looking at building a picture of people's movements and activities prior to a certain incident, we look at a whole host of mediums, who they were telephoning, if they'd been on the internet, if they'd been accessing and speaking to friends on Facebook or other social networking sites. And it was social networking which gave police their first lead, after they searched Michael's flat. In Vicky's laptop, there were some sheets of paper which were printouts from uh, Facebook. The pages identified several women who were all friends with Michael on Facebook. And at that early stage, the police officer questioned him and asked him, have you been having an affair? Everything suggested Vicky had been using Facebook to investigate her husband's affairs. Her and Mike knew each other's passwords for everything, so... It was something that she used to find something out. Not necessarily to catch Mike out, but just to find information out on The secret information Vicky uncovered put her five-month marriage in jeopardy, but could it also have triggered her murder? In the case of Vicky Roberts, after her death, the police started to investigate the relevance of social networking and the evidence that they found was overwhelming in this case. But this happens in other cases. In London, two months before Vicky Roberts was killed, another woman would lose her life. Lisa Beverly was viciously murdered by her ex-husband, Adam Mann, the day after she wrote insulting comments about him on social networking site Facebook. In the case of Lisa Beverly, it's interesting here, we have a situation where social networking seems to be the provocation for her, her husband to kill her. She was writing quite nasty, provocative statements in her Facebook about him, and he seems to have responded and unfortunately overreacted and, and killed her. This is one of the dangers that we're seeing more and more of people putting unscripted, uncontrolled comments on Facebook without thinking about the consequences. Mann denied reading the Facebook message and Lisa's murder, but he was convicted and jailed for a minimum of 24 years. In Suffolk, mother of three Mary Griffiths was killed by a former friend, John McFarlane, who became besotted by her. He followed her on Facebook and even claimed that they were having an affair. Mary rejected the idea and posted messages that McFarlane was deluded if he thought she would date him. His response was to brutally kill her. One of the things about stalkers is that they use whatever facilities available to get the information they want. The internet is an amazing tool for getting information about people and it can be useful, but it can also be used in a negative way. In this case, he's used it in a negative way. McFarlane pleaded guilty to murder and was eventually sentenced to 30 years in prison. In both cases, social networks had sparked a violent attack, but had also provided the clues which enabled police to get their man. We're seeing more and more situations where the police are using 
a social network to actually provide the evidence to get convictions. In Cheshire, police were analysing Michael Roberts' communications to build a picture of his affairs. Facebook printouts found at his flat identified a woman he might be seeing. And when Michael's mobile phone was recovered from a canal by police divers, it yielded further evidence of the secret relationship. We were able to examine the contacts that he'd had, uh, in particular the month before when there was over 5,000 communication contacts. These 5,000 communications were with just one girl, and she was on the printouts beside Vicky's laptop. It was apparent that they were speaking to each other as soon as they woke up in the morning, right through to when they, they uh, went to bed at night. And there was almost a, a frenzied amount of activity, texting each other constantly. It was clear from the nature of these text messages that Michael was having an affair. Michael Roberts consistently referred to the fact of how much he loved Vicky, how he would do anything for her, and how important she was in his life but his behaviour didn't reflect that. He was living a dual life. News of Michael's affairs came as a shock to Vicky's family. I thought he absolutely adored Vicky. Um, I didn't think he'd hurt her in any way. She loved him so much and I thought he really loved her as well. It's the picture that everybody had. I was really surprised to find out that he'd been having a first because he seemed so smitten with Vicky. Um, like I said, they were always holding hands, so we didn't see them argue. They were always together, it wasn't like he'd have an opportunity. I was really surprised because he, he seemed totally in love with her. I knew, I knew Vicky was totally in love with him. And they just seemed perfect for each other, and they were really both really happy. People are always fascinated about, can somebody leave a double life? Yes, people do all the time. We all do professionally. We have a professional life and a private life. You could be uh, a mother, a teacher, a politician, a sister and a daughter. You have different roles. In life, we all have different roles. People separate their roles. All, all happened here in Michael's case is that he separated his love life, one relationship from another relationship. People do that all the time, and they, a lot of people do it very successfully. Forensic tests proved that Vicky had died on the Sunday evening, so police now had to piece together Michael's movements in the four days between her death and the discovery of her body. The following day, Michael had arranged to see his girlfriend and some other friends and do some Christmas shopping, which he did. Whilst he was shopping, he put a call into Vicky's mum asking what Vicky wanted for Christmas, knowing that Vicky was dead in his flat. Not the behaviour the police expected from a grieving husband, and worse was to follow. The following day, Michael went into work. It was during that day that he went into a local supermarket and bought bin bags and some cling film. Items which police would later prove were used to wrap up Vicky's body. He'd gone to a lot of preparation and a lot of planning to buy the materials to wrap her in. Part of this is what makes us believe that he was his intention to try and get rid of Vicky's body by the end of the week. It appeared that police had discovered Vicky's body just in time. The case was falling into place, but D.I. Miller still had to establish exactly what happened in the hours leading up to her death. Vicky found some receipts relating to uh, an occasion the week before when Michael had been at a hotel with his girlfriend. After Michael went to work on, on the Sunday, it appears that Vicky went onto her laptop and had a look at the Facebook account of this particular girl. One look at the page confirmed Vicky's fears of an affair. It linked receipts in Michael's possession with the girl she believed he was seeing and put the two together. This is followed straight away by a phone call to him at work. I believe that she wanted to have a confrontation with him about his behaviour. The idea of a confrontation was confirmed by some handwritten letters found hidden in the flat. When they were searching through her stuff, they found letters that she'd written 
which were more like her thoughts that were written down that she wanted to confront Mike with. But she wasn't very confrontational, so she would have written it down first to get it right in her head. She obviously knew about the affairs, but I think she was more wanting the, the relationship with her and Mike to work. I think she was giving him a chance to put it right. In the letters, Vicky gave Mike a deadline to end his other relationships and to focus on their marriage. She's setting out a stall very clearly saying, I want you to stop and this is when you've got to stop by. And it says Saturday and it's interesting that she died on Sunday. She's using the deadline to provoke him into stopping, but she's not saying, I'm leaving you. She's saying, I want the marriage to carry on and I want it to be successful. But she's been very generous and he didn't take up that generous offer. Police now had a clear picture of the events leading to Vicky's death. She had gathered evidence of Michael's affairs. She'd used Facebook to confirm her suspicions. And, as her letters revealed, she was ready to confront him. On the night she died, Michael was still texting his other woman. His phone records would offer a dramatic insight into Vicky's final moments. At the time that we believe that Vicky was murdered, Michael sent a text to the girl saying, oh my God, my parents are here, they want a word. Which we believe was Michael's way of building some time. And it was in that period of time that we believe that, that Vicky was murdered. Once more, technology offered police an insight. But again, Michael had a different story. In interview, Michael said that after Vicky had died, it was an accident, and he sat in the corner of the room, shaking, crying, not knowing what to do. By complete contrast, when we spoke to Michael's girlfriend, she said that she had had a number of conversations with Michael on that night, and he appeared perfectly normal, chatty, and they were discussing what they were going to do the next day when they went out together. The police believed they had all the evidence to charge Michael Roberts with Vicky's murder. But in court, there would be one more twist in the story to test the nerve of Vicky's long-suffering family. Liverpool, September 2010. Michael Roberts faces a court charged with murdering his wife, Vicky. She had used Facebook to uncover her husband's affairs. And police believe he strangled her after a confrontation. But now they need to prove it in front of a jury. I didn't for one minute think he would put his family through a court case and I didn't think he'd want to put us through it. And I was so convinced that he would plead guilty prior to it, but I was quite shocked when he didn't. I think he thought that he would be able to talk and charm his way out of his position and convince the jury that this had all been a terrible accident. I wasn't surprised that he pleaded not guilty to the charge because I think in his head he was going to get away with it. Roberts was confident he would get away with murder. But at Liverpool Crown Court, the full facts of his crime and the cover-up of her death were laid bare. Michael took the precaution to cover the fact that Vicky's phone would be unanswered. So he went into Vicky's work and said that she had gone away on business and that she'd left her phone at the flat and therefore wouldn't be able to take any calls. The jury also heard how Roberts had later concocted an elaborate plan, sending texts from Vicky's phone to his own to make it appear she had walked out on the relationship. He then later sends texts from Vicky's phone, purporting to be from Vicky, to family members and friends, saying that she's left him because she's met somebody else and she wants some time to herself. These messages were intended to make Vicky's family believe that she was the one having an affair and had run away. In fact, 
she was already dead. The court also heard of three separate women that Michael had been secretly seeing, before and after his marriage to Vicky. He used text and Facebook constantly, even having multiple phones to keep the relationship secret. He was always texting, pretty much every time he went round he was he always had a phone call and he was he was always saying it was working. He used to walk out and go into his bedroom and like take the phone call. He was inseparable from his phone. He wasn't any different around us. Even when he was having the affairs, it was the same. It wasn't like he was a bit off or he was a bit quieter when he was texting the girls. He'd be sat around the table having dinner with us and a work of just text and stuff. So it's not like he'd even try to hide it. We see a person who is able to be socially skilled, communicating to the public all the time, a very personable nature, and then we see a completely different private, cold character who is able to run two or three relationships while uh, g getting engaged to Vicky and marrying Vicky. And even after killing her, was then able to engage in, in a relationship with his girlfriend at the time. A very cold, very calculating character. Michael's double life had been laid bare and his womanizing behavior exposed. The first time I met Michael Roberts was actually when he was in custody and we recorded the fact that he was flirting with one of the female officers who was put on the duty of looking after him in the cells. A picture was emerging of a man with no remorse. The jury heard he seemed unconcerned when she was supposedly missing and had even cracked jokes about killing her. When he told his colleagues that Vicky had left him, one of the colleagues said to him, are you sure you've not murdered Vicky and tried to get rid of her body? Michael's response to that was, have you ever tried getting a body into the boot of an MR2? It always crossed our minds that maybe he had tried getting a body into an MR2 and it just wouldn't fit. After three weeks listening to the evidence, the jury retired to consider their verdict. Michael Roberts was found guilty of murder. He just sat there with his head down and then he started crying when they told him how long he got. I always believed that Michael Roberts would be found guilty. From my perspective, the evidence was overwhelming. Roberts was sentenced to life in prison and was told he would serve a minimum of 17 years. Michael Roberts is quite obviously a dangerous man. To murder his wife with the obvious preparation and the planning afterwards to apparently dispose of the body shows the limits that he would go to. The mic that was stood in court was not the mic that we knew that we'd go to the pub with. It's a totally different person, it's someone that we don't know. Two years after Vicky's murder, her family are still coming to terms with their loss. It's just a gaping hole there, really. It's daft things like writing cards out, because you always want to put Vicky's name. The police were fantastic. I mean, they met us at like, the worst part of our life, but they got us through it. I think it's made us all more aware that Horrible things can happen. I don't understand why he did what he did. I thought he was really a nice guy. I thought he was quite kind and caring, but now I don't feel anything for him. Nothing. I don't even feel pity. How much of a role social networking played in the deaths of Vicky Roberts and all the other victims, only the killers can know for sure. But what is certain is that the modern way of communicating is as useful for police as it is for people who want to abuse it. When we look at communications for evidence, that we find evidence and motives of criminal acts, and that supports us in our investigation. In this case, it's quite interesting that Vicky actually used Facebook to find and, and substantiate her initial anxieties and suspicion. So in some ways, Facebook's actually ironically helped her to 